I am super excited about our special guest today. We have Ilko K, who is here to do a presentation on LinkedIn fundraising. It's more of a webinar style format today, but he's given this presentation to nonprofits all over the world for the past 10 years. It's evolved. We are super lucky to have him. So with that, let's welcome Ilko. Well, welcome, Ilko. I am very, very, very happy to have you on to do this this webinar of sorts for us because LinkedIn and nonprofits is a huge topic. It's actually one of our more popular video streams. So why don't I just turn this right over to you and you can begin your presentation? Sure. And thanks, Joanne, for having me. Uh, it's always a joy to talk about LinkedIn and to try to help educate nonprofits all over the world on how to use this. Um, which I've been doing for the past 10 years uh, in, in my roles uh, as a consulting in the international uh, um, fundraising sector, because LinkedIn has grown so much that we cannot ignore it anymore. I mean, ignore it is a decision not to, to optimize your fundraising. So what I'm about to show is a presentation, and I'll run through it a bit because of time. Um, always open, of course, for questions afterwards. Um, but this presentation is really based on practical experience on what I found necessary that nonprofits should be doing, could be doing um, in their fundraising efforts. So I'll start with a more generic update and background on trends of LinkedIn, how it has developed. And then I'll go into the nuts and bolts of how to apply very practically LinkedIn for your own nonprofit wherever you are in the world. So that is the plan. And if you're okay with that, I'm ready to start. Yeah, no, I think that sounds perfect. So let's begin. So again, as said, and I'll do this pretty quickly because I don't want to do a whole hour. I know the attention span of people and uh, uh, that's usually mine is short. So I, I, I would want to have myself as an audience and still be engaged at the end. So I want to briefly talk about trends, numbers, and dynamics of how LinkedIn has developed, um, how we can use LinkedIn um, when you go through the steps of the so-called fundraising cycle, and then trying to combine your own personal LinkedIn profile plus the profile of your, quote, company. Uh, let me put that right out there. LinkedIn uses the word company, but that's also a nonprofit, so that you know. They don't have a separate word like, oh, you're a nonprofit. They'll put another company. And what I want to show with this is like how you can use the world around you and just see it in a different light and use that to make your nonprofit grow in fundraising terms, which is also why I, I have this picture of Inception, which we already know, of course, great movie, which opened up a complete different world to the actors. So general statistics, LinkedIn has been growing. I mean, if you don't know that, you've been living on a rock, I suppose. Uh, and these are just a couple of statistics. I'm not going to mention them. You can read them and you can just be impressed and in awe of like how much and how quickly LinkedIn has grown in terms of members. I mean, this is already a while back and um, I'm going further into the future and the predictions like we're going to a billion because and mobile people use it daily more and more on their mobile phones. I do that too, several times a day. And if you look at that, this is again, back in time, 380 million, but then we reached half a billion. People were like, surprised, wow. Microsoft bought it and it went and it grew and it kept growing. And that is so interesting to see. Now, of course, some growth have gone down a little bit like in the US, but in other parts, like in Asia, growth really skyrocketed. But now at this point, you're in such a world that you cannot ignore LinkedIn anymore. If you look at these numbers, it's like, and I know some countries have their own forms of LinkedIn, like uh, uh, something that was already there. In other countries, they're being outfaced or not as used as much anymore. LinkedIn has been dominating and you cannot ignore this anymore. So if you look at this, the sheer number of people actively using LinkedIn, it's just amazing. So that means that if you want to get close to them, you better use LinkedIn. Now, of course, LinkedIn might have 
an extra boost because there's another social platform, which I'm not going to talk about, which isn't doing that great. That's Twitter. And I'm really curious. Now, this is a projection for the future. Will LinkedIn grow even more because of what's happening with LinkedIn? I don't know the answer, but I'm very, very curious about the statistics of the coming two years or so. Let's see what, what that's going to bring. So if you look at countries now, United States is still is still the best, but my specialty has always been US foundations and corporations. So of course, LinkedIn has been tremendously useful. Uh, other countries, again, might be a bit less, but it's growing. So you have to pay attention to LinkedIn and you have to use it strategically. Um, even in countries like Ukraine with a very young population, it is growing. And that is great news because it means that even in those areas where you say like, oh, who's doing that? Yes, it is happening. And you can see here that LinkedIn is still very much a new phenomenon because look at the age bracket that is mostly using them, it's 25 to 34. But if you then go to the Netherlands, then you see that there's a big chunk of users already that is a generation older. So you can see the development. This is what's going to happen in many other countries as well. And when I gave a similar presentation like this a couple of years ago to graduating students in the Netherlands, I told them you're lucky because you're the first generation to be able to use LinkedIn strategically for a job search because your boss is on LinkedIn as well. For Ukraine, for example, that's not the case yet. That will happen one generation away. But we can see that development going on. So how does LinkedIn make its money? It's again, I won't spend too much time, but it basically comes down to three elements and they are making a lot of money. So again, some statistics, you can just review whenever you have time, I won't go into them, but in the end, it comes down to talent solutions, marketing solutions, and premium subscriptions, by which I mean recruiting, you can see that all the time, recruiters are really, really active on LinkedIn. These days, recruiters can reach out directly to you over LinkedIn, like the cold approach, by the way, which is something I would not advise you to do as a fundraiser, but we'll get to that. But that is, recruiters have to pay a lot of money to LinkedIn to be able to use this because it's a trove. It's a treasure of talent right there. And of course, you can uh, uh, put your companies advertising advertisement on, on LinkedIn. So that's a second income stream for LinkedIn. Together with we individuals, we can pay for premium subscriptions. And one of the questions I get a lot is like for fundraising, do I need a premium subscription? Because I mean, it's pretty pricey. Um, and that is true. It is pretty pricey. My experience is that as a fundraiser, you do not need per se the premium subscription. It will help you in certain elements, but if money is really the driver, don't do it. I'll let you, I'll show you later why. So here we are with the fundraising cycle. <clears throat> Excuse me. The fundraising cycle is basically from A to Z. I'm interested in, I want to get funding for my cause until the moment that you actually got the funding. So which phases can we discern? Well, it's starting with the identification. Where are you going to fundraise? Is it with an individual? Is it with a foundation? Is it with a corporation? So just to find out where are you going to? Who are you going to ask for money? The second phase would then be to, oh, I have found this person or this foundation. How do I get in touch with them? What is the best way? Why would they be interested in talking to me? And then you go already into the cultivation phase, like developing a relationship. Because no one will give you automatically, instantaneously, spontaneously money just because you ask them. You will have to build up some kind of rapport. In the end, fundraising is very much a people-to-people -people business and not a organization to foundation business. In the end, it all comes down to very much people-to-people -people work. So once you get to know each other and you trust each other, then the moment comes up the so-called solicitation. They ask. And if the cultivation goes well, the ask might actually come from the donor side. They'll say like, hey, we've now 
vetted you, we've known you, we've seen the work that you do. We know that next year we're going to want to do this program and you might fit in. Do you want to talk about that? That's often how things start. So not with a formal letter, but with a more casual approach built out over this longer process. It's like a bit coming back to the students, like finding a job. Finding a job, most of us found a job through connections and through talking to people and not by sending that letter and then getting an answer. It's the same with fundraising. So once you've got the money, you go to the stewardship phase and the stewardship phase means that you appropriately thank the donor for the gift. This could be it could be something on the website or it could be the opposite. Some donors don't want to be mentioned at all. Anyway, that it doesn't matter as long as they know they're acknowledged for the support they give to your organization. So coming back to, as, as we see now, this whole fundraising cycle, LinkedIn is going to be mostly strategically of benefit to your nonprofit in the first two phases the identification phase and the connecting phase. Let me go into that. So generally speaking, LinkedIn is of great value. This is the best graph I could find. If somebody has a better one, perfect. Um, but what it really means is like, hey, you have X number of first degree connections. They all have their own first degree connections. So you have many more second degree connections. And if you count those, including the ones they have as first degree connections, meaning your third degree connections, you're suddenly connected to a whole lot of people. And that is that knowledge is of relevance for those two phases. Because when you go to the first part, the identification phase, how, how do you find it? Oh, I want, uh, I would like to be in touch with, I don't know, Coca-Cola or with uh, a bank. How how do I do that? Do I just send them a letter or no? You try to find people. And LinkedIn can help you find those people on the most informal basis possible. Three ways especially stand out. And that is through the options of companies, groups, and people. And I took a screenshot of that here when I... Um, so you have to imagine this is my LinkedIn uh, opening page and there's the, the search bar on the top and I just entered the word counterterrorism. I used to work in that field, so uh, I'm close to that. And then these subcategories, they will pop up and there you see companies, people, groups. And I wanted to highlight those three because they're of extra relevance to the search for the most informal connection through LinkedIn. So let's say you go in companies and say, okay, I'm a hospital that works with children with cancer. So what other organizations like mine are there? Because I want to know how they get their funding. I want to talk to somebody there. I want to maybe have a look at their annual report and see if I can find any suggestions. But first I need to know what is my mapping? Which other organizations are there? Now, well, there... You can look with the right buzzwords. And sure enough, many other organizations, companies will come up. And then you can click on those and continue your search. Sometimes you already know that you are that you are interested in reaching out to a certain company or organization like the Gates Foundation. You just type that in and it will come up. And then it will also show you like, hey, um, Oh, I know three people who work there because it says how many connections, first degree connections I have. And when I highlight them, say, okay, I can directly reach out to them. Uh, that is to say, if you know them well enough, because we all have connections. That's a bit of a, a warning here. We all have connections on LinkedIn with people that we don't know so well, or we would be, let me put it this way, uncomfortably, uncomfortable with to ask them for uh, advice or suggestions or help. So make sure that the connection is strong enough. This is also part of the reason why I 
I don't accept cold LinkedIn requests from people. If they don't write as to why they want to be connected, I want to have at least some kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction and to understand why they're reaching out to me, what, why I am of value to them, but also why they would be of value to me. In the end, this is a business network which has to benefit all. So then, but then through this search option through companies, I can see, oh, wait a minute, those three people work there. Oh, I know this person the best. Let's reach out to this person. And that's how you establish a calm, informal introduction with the Gates Foundation, which without LinkedIn, I would not have known. So this really opened, and I've been using LinkedIn for this type of connecting work more than 10 years. And of course, over the past 10 years, the options have grown because there have been more and more people using LinkedIn actively. When you go to groups, that second category, and again, we're looking for uh, hospitals who uh, treat children with cancer, then um, you see the following options coming up. <laughs> now, I remember here, I was just going through these groups. I was like, okay, that could be interesting. And the second one, which is called Developing Drugs for Children with Cancer, I say, wait a minute, it's ha this group has 157 members, but I this guy is second degree. So that could be interesting because he might have a lot of connections that in, in the fundraising field that I don't know, or he might be able to talk to me. So I looked him up and it looked, and suddenly I found we have three connections in common. One of which Richard, I know really well, and I'm totally comfortable in asking Richard for an introduction on an informal basis to, in this case, the Italian person, Cesare. So that would be a second way companies, groups to get closer to your fundraising strategy goal by using LinkedIn. And so then what? Once you have found, you, you have identified your, um, your person or your organization or the person within the organization, then what? How do you approach them? Again, in the, ca in the case I just showed to you, I know some people already really on really good basis. So it's, there's no problem. I can reach out to them. But with second degree connections, that is much harder. And so how do you do that? It should all be, always be your first goal to be introduced, not to do the introduction yourself. And be introduced means to have someone reach out to your desired connection in the most informal way. Think of it. Let's say you work in a bank and everybody wants to do business with you and everybody wants to get funding from you for their nonprofit. And you have heaps of applications of nonprofits. It's time consuming, you don't know them. And then you get this call from a friend who you know really well. And they said, well, I know somebody in India who's running this really interesting nonprofit. Do you think, you, would you be up for having a quick phone call with him? He's a friend or she's a friend. I trust this person. So I say, yes. And that's what I mean with trying to get into the door through an informal connection. But without LinkedIn, you would not know who your second degree or first degree connection is in that cycle. So this is why LinkedIn is so important also in the pitching connecting phase. Now, once you are talking to this person, there are different ways how to convey your message. And as we know, most of the message that we convey is through body language and tone, not per se by the words that we say, meaning the just the keyboard will not be your first choice. In fact, in this day and age, of course, it's something with a video. That would be best because in-person meeting is always best, but that is harder and harder. And it's also post pandemic it's more accepted to send somebody a Teams or a Zoom invite and to have an introduction like that, where you can see each other, where you can hear each other, where you can hear the tone, intonation, body language, 
And that is absolutely the best way to start building on that relationship. Now, if you then connect to a person, because that's what you try to do, um, either before the meeting or after the meeting, LinkedIn will give will tell you and give you the option to add a note. They used to hide that option. 10 years ago, it was almost impossible to find it, to find it. But LinkedIn has discovered like if we challenge people to put in an extra note, more there's more a higher degree of acceptance of invitations mean we will have more members and more exposure and it's good for business. So now you can personalize your invitation. And I, for example, I received this, uh, this is at least 10 years ago. But when this person ended with warmth and light, how can I not accept an invitation that ends with warmth and light? I mean, that is, that person really tried to make a connection and managed to do so. In the end, this is very much people to people. The hardest part, and I will really tell you the hardest part where the rate of success is lower is when it comes to a third degree connection. That everyone, That is just tough. Um, so thinking again of the elements, I want to be informally introduced to a third degree connection. In the end, what you're trying to do is to convert that third degree connection into a second degree connection. That means you have to move up one layer. Now, how do you do that and in, in which way? So you have to try to lay out all the second degree connections you have to that third degree. And try to see, are they working in the same sector? Because if they're working in the same sector, your chances are gonna be highest that they're willing to make the introduction because LinkedIn is a business network. They are there because of the content. This is not Facebook, this is not Twitter, this is a business network. So if you go over the line of the connection on the sector, you're, it's your best bet. It may not always work. And then you have to try to get uh, make your second degree a first degree and then ask that second degree who has now become a first degree, would you mind introducing me to? Now, this is a lot to ask, and it, this might take you some time because you will need to build up some kind of relationship with that newly established connection as well. But I've done it a couple of times. It did work, the informal connection, but it's it took me effort. This was not as easy going. It took time and effort, but it's not impossible. Coming back to an early question, like, do we need a premium account? I think I've urged the words informal and introduction now many times enough that reaching out cold to a person on LinkedIn is not the way to go. LinkedIn Premium offers exactly that, that you can send emails or in-mails, as they call them, directly to people. But that comes down to writing an application out of the blue without knowing, without being introduced. So in the end, if that is really the major advantage of LinkedIn for fundraising purposes of the premium account, don't bother spend the money. You can see who, who, show, who, who visit your account. That's all nice, but is it really relevant for fundraising per se? No. So my question, my answer has always been, if you don't want to spend that money, you can absolutely, absolutely do this strategic fundraising over LinkedIn without the premium account. Unless, of course, LinkedIn changes things, in, which they often do, but we're talking January 2023, and so far, this still stands. So wrapping things up for a personal use, LinkedIn is not just a nice profile where you can put things on. It is your database. It is your CRM. It is a plan that you nurture and grow every day. And you have to treat it as such. So you really have to be, every day it's going bigger. That means every day you have to 
realize that its strategic value with that is growing as well. And think from different angles. You, you now know you can look and search for people in the identification phase through different ways. Try that. Always try to think also from the perspective of the other. Why would a person be willing to talk to you? And if that's not completely clear, that makes, again, it underlines how important it is to be introduced by somebody because the trust over that connection will be stronger than the interest they have themselves in talking to you. They will trust that person that this is a valuable connection. So leaving the personal profile aside, um, let's have a look at the at your nonprofit's presence on LinkedIn or the company profile as LinkedIn calls it. Um, that just has to be good. And somebody needs to be dealing with that. Somebody has to update that, put status updates there, um, good pictures, and then you can grow to the St. Jude's, look at the number of followers they have. That means, and you can study them. If you have, if you find a nonprofit or foundation, whoever you want, a competitor of yours, that of which you think, wow, they're doing much better than we are on LinkedIn, then study them for a couple of months. Why are they so much better? How often do they post? What do they post? Is it visuals, is it photos, is it videos? Is it stories? What what do they do that they deserve so many followers? There's, there's never a better source than your competitor to learn from when it comes to LinkedIn. So here's just a couple of suggestions to um, help uh, blossom your own company's nonprofit's profile on LinkedIn. And um, if you Google, YouTube, the, some search terms. You can, you'll can you probably be able to find many more tips. This is really just a couple. And if you that then combine the two, meaning, hey, we have this company, this nonprofit profile on LinkedIn, which is great, but we're also trying to unearth the knowledge that our staff has and the connections they have. So try to have them follow you and ask for comments and sharing, resharing of posts that you have, because then you can really get out of your bubble and it can get bigger and bigger because otherwise you will remain invisible and that's not what you want. So the optimal use of both profiles will avoid that from happening, but it will take time. This is not an overnight process. And as said, think strategically have someone within your organization work on the company page and interact with your staff on how to post boost whatever is going on on linkedin also through the company page well that was amazing thank you so much which leads to the next portion of it which is that content marketing for your nonprofit's organizational page. And I actually did a, a video on using LinkedIn newsletters. So I'll make sure to link that in the video as well. And uh, I really hope that we get an opportunity to do that presentation, that joint presentation that, that we were talking about. Because with, with what you've done here and then incorporating the content marketing into it and even some ads, I mean, nonprofits, it's amazing what they can do on LinkedIn. Exactly. And, and, and you're so much more the expert here than I am. And I'm very curious in, in your part of this. I want to learn too. And I'm going to link your contact information in the uh, description on YouTube. And this is probably going to be a podcast as well. So in the show notes on the podcast, so that people can reach out to you if they have any questions or need some help. But uh, we really appreciate this. Good. No, and thank you. Because uh, um, to me, it, I can do this by heart, basically, but then you have to do the hard work and the editing and all that. And uh, I'm really curious about your part of the presentation. And I just hope really we can, we're going to get it. So, because um, that would be an awesome piece of content for any international nonprofit.